the Churches of Christ present Bible Talk. Does it really matter what I do? Many have wondered about that very question. Many yet live as though their actions have no consequences at all. But the truth is that our decisions in the moments of life have a great impact. And some of our decisions have an eternal impact. So what you do, it truly matters. And that's our study today. So stay tuned after this song of praise. Hello again, and thank you for joining us for our study of God's Word today. It's our prayer and our ultimate aim to be pleasing to God by preaching the truth of His Word. Today I pray for open hearts, open ears, and open Bibles as we study together. And as always, I want to personally thank you for giving me this opportunity to study God's Word with you today. On April the 12th, 2004, ABC News named Nobel Prize and Presidential Medal of Honor recipient Norman Borlaug as its Person of the Week. And he was given all of these honors because in the 1940s he hybridized a high-yield, disease-resistant corn and wheat which flourished and regenerated in places where no seed had before. And it has been estimated by some that this discovery is... Uh, directly responsible for the saving of over two billion lives worldwide as a result of this great work. But you know, perhaps that honor should have been given to Henry Wallace. You know, Wallace was the vice president under FDR and had been the secretary of agriculture. He believed in the power of plants and used his office and his position to create an experiment station in Mexico for the sole purpose of hybridizing corn and wheat. And he hired a young man named Norman Borlaug to run it. So perhaps the honor should belong to him for the saving of these lives. Or maybe the honor should be given to George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver, not a stranger to us by any stretch of the imagination, but as a 19-year-old student at Iowa State, he had a dairy sciences professor who would often send his six-year-old son on expeditions with Carver. And it was during these expeditions that a love of plants and what they could do was instilled in the six-year-old boy. It was George Washington Carver who pointed six-year-old Henry Wallace toward the love of plants. And who would have thought that after all of his accomplishments, that spending afternoons with a six-year-old boy would have the greatest impact on humanity. So maybe the honor should go to George Washington Carver. Or maybe it should go to Moses and Susan Carver, farmers and landowners in Diamond, Missouri. They lived in a slave state, but they didn't believe in slavery, which made them a target for groups like Quintrill's Raiders. And sure enough, one night the Raiders came, burned his barn, shot several people, took a woman named Mary Washington who refused to let go of her infant son, George. Two days later, Moses secured a meeting with the raiders and traded his last horse for whatever was in a dirty burlap sack. When Moses opened the bag, he found the cold infant clinging to life. 
He opened his coat, placed the baby next to his skin, took him home, raised him as his own son, even giving him their name, George Washington Carver. Or maybe it was their parents, or on and on the list we could go as to who should be responsible for this honor. But what all of this illustrates, and the reason that I'm saying all of this, is to point out the fact that the decisions that we make in life have an impact beyond our imagination. There's no way that when the Carters or when the Carvers took it, him in that they had any idea that he would one day influence a six-year-old boy who would one day be vice president and secretary of agriculture, who would one day hire another man that would lead to a discovery that would save over six billion lives worldwide. But the decisions that they made in the moments of their life impacted untold numbers of individuals. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 4 through 10, God gave the instructions that His Word is to be taken into our hearts first, but then His Word is to be taught. He said, teach it when you sit at home. Teach it when you're traveling. Teach it before you go to bed. Teach it when you, when you wake to another day. God is telling us that in the moments of life, you need to be teaching and studying His Word. And He's telling us that what you do in the moments of life, they matter. What you do in the moments of life carry an impact of eternal weight. Friends, what you do, it truly matters. I want to notice with you first that what we do, the decisions that we make, matter when no one else is around. I think about Joseph. In Genesis chapter 39, we find Joseph in Potiphar's house, and, and you remember how Joseph got there. You remember that he was his father's favorite. He was given that coat of colors. You remember he had visions of his brothers and his, even his mother and father bowing down to him, and his brothers hated him. They were jealous and hated him. So much so that they sold him into slavery. Joseph, you remember, ends up in Potiphar's house after, that, uh, after being sold into slavery and works and, and conducts himself in such a way that he becomes uh, the one in charge over all of Potiphar's house. And eventually, you remember how that Joseph is going to end up being second in command over all of Egypt. But in Genesis chapter 39, everything is hanging in the balance. Because Potiphar's wife set her eyes on him, and he resisted her strongly at first. You know, when, when she comes to him the first time, he says, How can I commit this great wickedness and sin against God? But then Genesis 39 and verse 10 says, She came to him day after day after day, until finally one day when no one else was around, she caught him by his garment, and the situation had gotten so severe that it was at that point that Joseph literally ran out of his clothes and left her there. But think about how easy it would have been for Joseph to, to say, you know, no one else is here. You know, she's not going to tell anybody because, you know, she doesn't want to get in trouble and I'm not going to tell anybody because I don't want to get... Nobody else is around. Nobody's going to know. And yet even though no one else was around, Joseph understood that someone was watching that God was watching. You fast forward to Genesis chapter 42 and he saves his father, his brother, and God's people from the famine that's in the land. Joseph didn't know that was going to happen. Joseph didn't know what the future had in store. But in Genesis chapter 39, with all of that hanging in the balance, his decision that day had an impact on what was going to take place. What if he had decided, because no one else is around, I'll do this, then he probably never saves his family later on in chapter 42. Think about David, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. You know the story. You know, that it was a time when kings go to war, and yet David's at home, David's at his palace, and he sees Bathsheba bathing, and her husband's not there. He's off at war. He's one of David's mighty men. And so he's off at war. And so you have David and Bathsheba, and in a sense, there's no one else around. Nobody else is there. And look at the impact that that decision had on the rest of David's life. 
When no one else was around, David made the decision to send for her, to lie with her, and ultimately to have her husband killed so that he might take her to be his wife. And the results were that the baby died. Absalom, his son, rebels and is killed. And David's house never knows peace from that point forward because of the decision that he made when nobody else was around. Friends, what we do, it matters even when we think no one is watching. We need to remember we're never truly alone, Hebrews 4 and verse 13, because all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. What you do, it matters when no one else is around. But then number two, what you do matters even when you're in a crowd. Remember the story of Caleb and Joshua in Numbers chapter 13 and 14? They were two of the twelve spies who were told to go into the land to spy it out to see if it was exactly what God said it would be. They come back with the other ten and with the fruit of the land in their hands showing that it is exactly what God said it would be. And yet the ten stir up the rest of the nation to say, we can't do it, we can't go in and take it, we, won't, you know, we are but grasshoppers in our sight and in theirs. Every member of that generation save Joshua and Caleb, were going to perish in the wilderness wandering because of their decision not to go in and take the land, because of their decision to, to go along with the evil report. You know, how easy it would have been for Joshua and Caleb to just you know, go along with the crowd, to say, listen, uh, the other ten have said we can't do it, so we can't do it. The whole nation right now is saying we can't do it. So we can't do it. How easy it would have been for them to go along to get along. And they didn't know what the end result was going to be. They didn't know that it was going to make God so angry that He was going to cause every person in that generation from 20 years old and upward to perish. But look at what happened to them instead. Joshua becomes a successor to Moses. Caleb gets Hebron, that mountain, for an inheritance 40 years later. The decision that they made on the day when the rest of the nation said we can't do it had an impact on their lives and where they went from that point forward. What you do matters even when you're standing in a crowd. What you do matters, number three, when you're in the safety and the quietness and the, the, the peace of your home, you know, the privacy of your home. We have to be careful sometimes, as I've shared with you in the past, that the home can be the easiest place to sin because we feel like we're at ease and we're at peace and we're in a, in a private place and, and no one's going to know. But friends, the decisions that we make in the home and with those who are in our home have a tremendous impact. There's a lot of reasons that we could consider the example of Noah. But I want us to think for a minute about Noah in respect to his family, Genesis chapter 6. Peter tells us later on, 2 Peter 2 and verse 5 and 1 Peter 3 and verse 20, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and, and really sort of implies that Noah was preaching the entire time that the ark was being prepared. And yet the entire time, however long it took to prepare the ark, Noah is a preacher of righteousness and he's trying to tell others about the coming judgment, the coming destruction, you know, that the saving vessel is the ark. You've got to be in the ark. And in all that time, do you know how many converts Noah had? Seven. But they were the most important seven souls that a person could convert because they were the seven of his own house. What if Noah had decided to be like the rest of the world? You know, what if he decided that his home could be just like everyone else's home? Then neither Noah nor his family enter into the ark. I think Noah, while preaching in the streets at night, was teaching in the home, telling his sons about God, telling his sons about God's commands, telling his sons about God's judgment. Friends, what we do in the home, it matters. Later on, when the, when the waters begin to rain and the fountains of the deep begin to open up, Noah was able to go into that ark with his family because what he did in the home mattered. But then you think about the fact that it also matters what we do, number four, when far from home. 
It is sad that some think whenever they leave home, perhaps they, they travel to a place where nobody knows them, maybe on vacation, and, and they think, well, now I can just, you know, now I can let my hair down, and now I can live and do as they please because no one here knows me. No one here is, is going to be able to say, hey, you know, I saw you doing this or that, and that's not right. And, and in my opinion, to me, that's no doubt the logic of the prodigal, Luke chapter 15. You know, there's a reason that he demanded his inheritance. And then the text says, and then he took his journey into the far country. You know, he didn't go next door and start spending his inheritance on wicked living. And he certainly couldn't stay there and do it at the father's house. There's something about that situation that tells us that the the prodigal son understood that in order for me to go really let my hair down and and let loose and live wickedly and do whatever I want to do, I've got to get far away from my father's house to do that. And once he was in the safety, so to speak, of the far country, far away from the prying eyes of his father and his elder brother, he wasted his substance on wicked living. But then you think about Daniel. Daniel 1 and verse 8, Daniel finds himself removed from his home and in a strange place. And yet Daniel purposed in his heart not to be defiled by the king's meat. Someone must have forgotten to tell Daniel that when you're far away from home, it's okay to do sinful things. Somebody forgot to let Daniel know that when you're, you know, uh, when you're in a strange country, you just do what they're... You know, when in Rome, you do as the Romans do. Someone forgot to tell Daniel that. Because here Daniel is still saying, I will not be defiled. And later on, it impacts the king, it impacts his position, it impacts the position of his three friends and their faithfulness. Because what you do matters even when you're far from home. Then the question comes, what can I do? You know, if what we do matters when I'm alone, when I'm in the crowd, when I'm at home, when I'm far from home, then what is it that I need to be doing? What can I do? I want to go back with you to Deuteronomy chapter 6 where God is telling us that what you do in the moments of life, it matters. Notice with me Deuteronomy 6. and Let's read verses 4 through 10. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt uh, shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates, and it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things. Deuteronomy 6 and verses 4 through 10, God is telling us that in the moments of life, this is what I can do. This is what I need to do. Number one, I need to listen. In verse 4, He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. He starts off by calling our attention. You need to hear. You need to listen. God is speaking. He has spoken. He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now I need to listen. I need to listen to God speak from His Word. I need to spend time meditating in His Word day and night like the blessed man, Psalm 1. I need to give my diligence to understanding the Scriptures and and standing approved in the sight of God, rightly dividing the Word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. God has spoken. And he's saying in the moments of life, you need to listen. You need to listen to God speak from His Word as often as possible. But then number two, you need to love. Verse, five, verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, listen to me. But then in verse 5, he says, Love me. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and might. Think about how having a love for God... And the love of God impacts everything that we do in all the relationships of our lives. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love is so foundational to what we do and to how we live that when Jesus was asked, What's the greatest command? He said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
and the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. That is, if you get these two right, the others seem to just sort of more naturally fall in their proper place. Because with this, everything else is hanging in the balance. God is saying in the moments of life, here's the decisions that you need to make. Number one, you need to make the decision to listen to God. Number two, you need to make the decision to love God. And then number three, you need to make the decision to leash God's Word to your life and to your heart. In Deuteronomy 6, uh, uh, in, in verse 6 and verse 8, God says, let these things be in thine heart. You know, we must seek to bind the Word of God to our own hearts before we can ever go about teaching it to others. So oftentimes when we go to Deuteronomy 6, we focus in on God telling us to teach His Word, whether we rise up, lie down, walk by the way, and so forth. But before we ever get to that point, it first has to be in my heart. You know, I can't help you, I can't serve you, I can't encourage you or, or teach you unless the Word has first been leashed to my own heart. Make the decision to hide God's Word in your heart. Psalm 119 and verse 105. It'll keep you from sin. It'll guide your path. Psalm 119 and verse 11. And then number four, God is saying in the moments of life, choose a spiritual legacy. Verses 7 and 9. Teach the Word to your children. Let them wake up to the sound of hymns being sung. Let them fall asleep with mama and daddy leading them in prayer. Let them see the pages of God's Word, the Bible, opened in the home and not just on the church pew. Teach the Word of God to your children. Leave that spiritual legacy for them. And then finally, God says, and then you'll have life. Everlasting life is the intention, verse 10. There is a land of promise a land of everlasting life, that land of no mores, Revelation 21 and verse 4, where there be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, neither shall there be any more tears, for God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. But friends, what we do, it matters. In the moments of life, whether alone or in a crowd, whether we're at home or far from home, in the moments of life, choose to listen to God Choose to, to hear Him speak from His Word. Choose to love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Choose to leash His Word to your heart. Bind it to your heart. Choose to leave behind a spiritual legacy upon which future generations will be influenced for eternity. And choose to have that everlasting life which God has offered to all. Friends, what you do, it matters. And what you do with the Lord's invitation today matters. If you're sitting there today and you've never obeyed the gospel, your decision right now matters. It matters whether or not you have faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. It matters if you're willing to repent of your sins, Acts 17 and verse 30. To confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And friends, it matters if you're baptized, fully immersed, in order to have your sins washed away. Mark 16, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21, Acts 2 and verse 38. If you've obeyed those initial commands, then are you living faithfully? Paul said in Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2 that we're to be living a transformed life. And our decision to do so truly matters. I pray that today's lesson has been a blessing to you. Thank you again for tuning in, and God bless.
Do you have any questions about the Bible? Are you searching for a place to worship God like you find in the Bible? Do you have questions about your eternity? Would you like to know more about God's plan for you? Let me encourage you to visit a church of Christ near you today. And if you're interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, we also offer free material. For more information or if you would like to have a transcript or a copy of today's program, whether audio or video, please go to our website at www.bible-talk.org or you can email us at bible.talk at bible-talk.org. You can also write to us at Bible Talk, P.O. Box 40, Fayette, Alabama, 35555. Simply include the program number and we'll be happy to send that to you completely free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in and may God bless you richly in your walk with Him. Singing provided by the Edmund Church of Christ, Edmond, Oklahoma, producers of In Search of the Lord's Way. You can visit their website at www.searchtv.org.